Na okrugli mizi bodo. Gospa Marija Trung, ki se nam je pravkar predstavila z izčrpno analizo. Gospa Tiva Montalbano, ki prihaja iz The Princess Regeneration Fund iz Londona in smo imeli priložnost bolje spoznati že ob začetku konference. Gospa Jerneja Batič, ki prihaja iz Odelka za kulturo mestne občine Ljubljana. Večino svoje profesionalne poti je posvetila varovanju kulturne dediščine. Najprej na Republiškem zavodu za varstvo kulturne dediščine Slovenije, kjer je vzpostavila področje promocije kulturne dediščine in obsežnejšo založniško dejavnost. Na to je na Ministrstvo za kulturo vodila področje premične kulturne dediščine in področje delovanja slovenskih muzejev, ter so delovala pri pripravi nove zakonodaje na področju varstva kulturne dediščine v Sloveniji. V mestni občini Ljubljana se v zadnjih letih posveča posameznim projektom, kot so vzpostavitev kino dvora, revitalizacije nekdanje tovarne rok in cokrarne, obnova plečnikove hiše, obnova in vzpostavitev arheološkega parka Imona ter prenova Švicerije. Alma Selimovič, Alma Ređič Selimovič, pardon, prihaja iz Zavoda Bunker. Je magistrica znanosti, smeri manažment neprofitnih organizacij, in univerzitetna diplomirana kulturologinja. V Zavodu Bunker deluje vse od leta 2003 kot producentka predstav Mednarodnega festivala Mladi Levi, kot programerka in izvršna producentka festivala Drugajanje in vodja razvojnih projektov ter mednarodnih programov, v katerih pridobiva tudi finančna sredstva. Razvija in izvaja tudi projekte na področju kulturno-umetnostne vzgoje, Zanimajo kulturna politika, povezovanje sodobne umetnosti in formalnega izobraževanja ter umetnost kot degenerator socialnih sprememb in inovacij. Gospod Massimiliano Leprati je predsednik neprofitnega raziskovalnega in izobraževalnega centra Ekonomija e sostenibilita. Je svetovalec italijanskih nevladnih organizacij in član odbora Združenja Asociacione Kašina Kukanja. Od leta 1992 se ukvarja z družbenimi in ekološkimi vprašanji, predvsem pa se posveča proučevanju ekološke tranzicije v gospodarstvu, mednarodne neenakosti in razmeri med gospodarstvom in kulturo. Izdal je vrsto esejev in strokovnih knjižnih del. Okroglo mizo bo moderirala Meta Štular, samostojna vodja kulturnih projektov z 20-letnimi strokovnimi izkušnjami. A... V zadnjem času se je osredotoča na razvoj in projektno vodenje na področju kulturne in urbane obnove. Trenutno za muzej in galerija mesta Ljubljane vodi interdisciplinarni produkcijski prostor Roglab, pilotni projekt za bodoči javni zavod v Ljubljani, ki v spred je postavila kreativne industrije in inovacije. Izvolite. Ravno zato sem hotela prositi. Hvala lepa za ta lepo vod, Tamara. Najprej bi vam povedala, na kakšen način bo okrogla miza potekala in sicer bomo z sogovornikom in sogovornicami klepetali približno 50 minut, ampak ne bom jaz edina, ki bom zastavljala vprašanja, se bomo na koncu imeli še 15 minut za vprašanja in odgovore in upam, da bo debata dovolj živakna, da vas bo spodbudila, da se boste te seanse potem tudi udeležili. Ti vam mogoče najprej vprašanje zase, ki je mogoče bi lože očitno iz tvojega predavanja, vendar te vprašam še enkrat, ker je tukaj namreč zelo veliko predstavnikov lokalnih skupnosti. Zakaj naj bi neka lokalna skupnost ali pa zasebni subjekt ulagala v revitalizacijo stavb kulturne dedične na ta način, da jih namenjata skupnostni rami, ne pa na primer nekim komercijalnim namenom. It's a very good question. It's also a very difficult question um, because I think looking at the economic direction, um, public funding for these kind of projects is diminishing. Um, particularly in the UK, we don't see that situation improving at all in the future. Um, 
our economic situation is going to get worse um, for various reasons. And um, ideologically, our government is not interested in investing in that kind of work. It thinks that the market can take care of it. It thinks that volunteering can take care of it. Um, so it is a really valid question right now. Um, why should we put some of these buildings to community use? I think the, um, the power station that we saw last night is a really good example where an NGO is actually supporting an entire network of other charities and NGOs that need the support in order to continue to do good work. So it's almost like a house of cards, if you will. Um, also, I think it's important to bear in mind that sometimes we underestimate the power of community activity and community activism. And it's often the communities themselves who have the best idea for what to do with the building and for how to make that building survive in the future to make it viable. Um, and I think the concept of building partnerships between community groups and private entities that have the business acumen to actually make those en enterprises succeed is exactly the direction of travel because public funding is is diminishing. Hvala ti va. Kaj pa ti misliš, um, kaj je prvi korak v revitalizacijskem procesu? Na kaj moramo najprej misliti? Ali najprej, ko, ko recimo smo nek občin, delamo na občini, vidimo, da imamo v lasti neko lepo, staro hišo in jo hočemo obnoviti. Oč, kaj prvi korak? Najprej razmišljamo o denarju, o politikah, o ljudeh, o, se najprej obrnemo na, za, na zavod kulturne dediščine. Kako, kako, kako sploh pridemo v proces revitalizacije? Well, I think, first of all, you need to think about the context. I mean, if it's one building and it's one of 50 buildings that needs work, then you need to look in a much wider scale. And that's where you look at sort of regional policy and ideas for how to potentially address all of those things at once. If it's just one building, um, I think it's really, really important to understand what the potential end uses are. So I think something like a feasibility study, which informs um, what the parameters are within which you are working in the building, which parts of the building can be modified, which parts of the building need a lot of repair, what the potential functions of that building might be. But it also involves market testing. So, for example, if you want a building to be a theatre, you better make sure that there aren't four other theatres within a mile um, because it's not going to be able to compete, for example. I mean, it might, but it's going to put somebody else out of business, potentially. So it's really important to understand the, the context. And I think... The responsibility for that understanding can rest with the local municipality if they wish to foster that kind of environment, or it can also come from the bottom up, from community mm -hmm. group who can say, look, we want to save this building, we want to find a use for it, let's think strategically about how to do that. So there are a couple of ways that it can be done. Hvala. V vašem, vaši predstavitmi so, smo tudi videli, da uh, to strateško razmišljanje zahteva sodelovanje različnih sektorjev. Um, Kakšno je stanje med sektorskega sodelovanja v Veliki Britaniji? Um, it's, it's good, actually. Intersectoral cooperation is good, but it is difficult. Um, particularly because local government and central government have um, had reduced funding for a very long period of time. Particularly local government is being affected. Um, the funding cuts have meant that in the last 10 years, um, the provision for conservation expertise in local government has declined by nearly 40%, um, which is having a big impact on local authorities' abilities to make decisions, to be strategic, and to make nuanced decisions. So if you don't have someone with conservation expertise making decisions that have to be made in the local authority, Either they make bad decisions or they just say no. And that's not constructive because just saying no is not going to find solutions for buildings. It's, um, it's very challenging because local government funding is changing in the UK. Um, by 2021, there will be no central funding for local governments from the UK government. They must be able to pay for everything they do from the money they generate within their own boundaries, which means that the rich areas are going to get richer and the poor areas are going to get poorer, which highlights how important it is to find alternative sources of funding and alternative ways of making buildings pay for themselves because mm -hmm. the 
government backstop that we all have come to expect may not be there in future. Hvala zdaj ste mi napeljali na dve vprašanje in sicer na vprašanje ljudi in vprašanje denarja. Pa se lotimo najprej vprašanja denarja. In sicer v Veliki Britaniji imate dolgo tradicijo in prakso javno za sedmih partnerstov. Glede na to, da je pač financiranje strani javnega sektorja vse manjše, vsi upamo na financiranje strani zasebnega sektorja. Vendar pa me zanima, kaj ste se iz teh izkušanj javno zasebnega partnerstva v Veliki Britaniji naučili. V zadnjem času v časopisih beremo, da tudi v zahtevah po ponovni nacionalizaciji recimo britanskih železnic. Kaj pravite, na kakšen način bi se to vrstnim problemom in zapletom lahko nekako izognili na področju kulturne dediščine? Ok, so it's quite a complex question, because it's about how projects are funded. I think a, a more terrifying example of the failure of public-private partnerships is actually the UK national health system. Um, in the 1990s and the 2000s, um, private companies were contracted to build new hospitals and to operate new hospitals, and they were paid by the government, and they used the government's money as collateral for loans. And the government now has to pay them for the service they're providing. Um, I, I saw a statistic the other day that said a hospital that cost 100, 118 million pounds to build is now costing 1.8 billion to pay back to the private sector. So I think the key to a public-private partnership is you have to think about the horizon. It's not just about saving money now because that might actually have a sting in the tail. Um, it's, it's really essential to ensure that if you do have a public-private partnership, the contracts are really sound um, because private industry is in this for short-term gain and that's not why the rest of us are here. We're here for the long-term survival of these assets. Um, it can be done and it can be done really, really successfully. I think there are some really cracking examples that I gave earlier today. The King's Cross area in central London is a good example where there was um, a private construction company. There are private companies like Google are building their headquarters there. Um, there's an education institution. There, there was a lot of meantime uses with community groups. In fact, <laughs> They, they had a sort of a meantime community garden, and when the time came to clear that site for construction, there was a petition to try and keep the garden forever. Um, but everybody accepted that at the beginning it was meant to be temporary. So th these, these things can be done, but they have to be done very, very carefully, and I would, I would warn against only inviting private entities in for the sake of financial expediency. Sometimes the hard journey might be the safer one. Um, so just be very careful, I would say. It, it can be done. Hvala. Zdaj pa še vprašanje ljudi. Prej ste omenili, da je lahko velik problem tudi določeno pomankanje znanj pri ljudeh. Kako se tega lovitevate v Veliki Britaniji? Na kakšen način izobražujete bodoče menedžerje stav kulturne dediščine? There are a couple of ways that that this is being done in the UK. Um, the first is the use of uh, technology. Obviously, a lot of knowledge can be shared on the internet and can be shared in perpetuity so that anybody can learn what they need to learn. Better is to learn by doing. Um, national bodies are trying very hard to empower those who work in conservation and in local government especially to give them the skills they need to make the decisions that they need to make and to ask the questions that they need to ask about projects that are being proposed to them. Um, one of the other areas where the UK is really, really strong is the Great British Amateur. Um, our voluntary society is enormous. We have something like four or five hundred thousand people who volunteer in the heritage industry in the UK. In, and that's from, you know, people who help garden in a country house to people who are actually spearheading multi-million pound regeneration projects on behalf of a charity. Um, and the skills of those people are actually crucial. Um, Organisations like mine are here to help them. 
to to give them the skills, to tell them where to look, to 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 support them in any projects that they might be working on. Um, but I think it's broader than that, and I think. Um, one of the benefits that our, our current society has is that a lot of people, they retire when they're 50, 60, and then they have a good 25 or 30 years of productivity left in them, and they want to do some good, so they volunteer in, in the kind of organisations that are involved in heritage. Um, and that is fantastic, and that has proven really, really beneficial for heritage, but in the long term, I'm going to have to work until I die. I, I, I'm not going to be able to retire my pension is not going to be worth anything. I would love to be able to dedicate 30 years to supporting heritage projects, but realistically, the means of encouraging those volunteers to work in those kinds of projects has to change because people cannot go to a meeting every Tuesday night. You know, you have to be able to do things like have a Skype call or find in alternative ways of involving people. And there are degrees of interest as well. You know, it's, it's like getting into a swimming pool. Some people just dip their toe in and they're like, yeah, good job, bye. Some people get into their knees and they're like, yes, I'll help you for the, the, the festival, but then mm -hmm, I have a job. And then there's some people who just jump in head first. And it's really important when you manage volunteers and you manage the workforce that you remind yourself that there are different tiers of volunteering. You can't expect a toe dipper to jump in head first. Um, and so, being able to cater to the needs of those people will actually go on a huge returns in the long run because they will stay engaged and they will contribute, but in a very different way to the way I think the current generation is contributing, um, just because of the nature of work and the nature of technology. Voilà. Uh, Jernea Batic, um, uh, Z vašimi dogoletnimi izkušnjami nam boste zagotovo znali razsvetliti kar nekaj vprašanj, uh, ki bi se jih mogoče, ki bi jih mogoče na vas naslovili tudi um, drugi kolegi iz drugih občin. In sicer uh, dopodne smo slišali, da v Sloveniji kar na veliko obnavljamo stavbe kulturne dediščine, vendar pa da vedno to ni najboljši način revitalizacije, se, po, se pri obnovi pozabimo na osebine. Na kakšen način se revitalizacija stavb kulturne dediščine uh, lotevate v Ljubljani in uh, na kakšen način dejansko razvijete že od vsega začetka vsebine, ki naj bi bile v teh uh, stavbah? Hvala za vprašanje. Um, začela bom mogoče mečkom bolj nazaj. Um, na mestni občin Ljubljana smo pred 11. leti pravzaprav začeli neko sistematično delo, ne samo na področju kulturne dediščine, ampak tudi kulture na sploh. Um, namreč lotili smo se kar številnih analiz, um, na podlagi katerih je bila pripravljena strategija. Uh, ta strategija je pravzaprav osnova za vse nadaljne delovanje, tudi na področju kulturne dediščine, o kateri danes, danes govorimo. Uh, Pomembno je pa to zato, ker vsaka strategija je seveda da široko predebatirana in preverjena v javnosti med seveda številnimi zainteresirano javnostjo in seveda umetniki, ustvarjalci in tako naprej. Iz te strategije pravzaprav črpamo uh, naše ideje in naše, naša nova znanja in vedenja, ko se lotimo na primer tudi načrtovanja obnove nekega kulturnega spomenika. Zakaj? Na eni strani imamo v strategiji pravzaprav zapisano, kakšne so potrebe posameznikov, stvarjalcev, javnih zavodov, javnosti. Na drugi strani pa pravzaprav imamo nek nabor kulturne dediščine, kulturnih spomenikov, problemov, kot temu včasih rečemo, ki jih seveda moramo spraviti nazaj v življenje. Z prepletom pravzaprav teh dveh zadev pridemo do neke osnovne ideje, kaj pravzaprav v nek prostor lahko postavimo. Seveda pa v vsaka stavba, vsak kulturni spomenik seveda ne more funkcionirati na način, da ne vem, um, daš v nek prostor bolnišnico ali daš v nek prostor muzej, kamor seveda to ni smiselno. Um, treba je seveda iskati tudi uh, uh, bistvo tega kulturnega spomenika. To se pravi, kako živi, kakšna je njegova zgodovina in kaj je tisto, kar ga bo nadgradilo. Uh, tak primer, na primer, uh, je zdaj ravno Švicarija, ki, jo, ki je v zaključni fazi, to je stavba uh, v Tivoliju, v neposrednji bližini mednarodnega grafičnega likovnega centra. Uh, 
Tam smo se prav na ta način lotili zadeve in sicer tako, tako da uh, smo skozi zgodovino uh, stavbe prišli do tega, da pravzaprav je bilo od nekdaj pač neko močno kulturno središče, umetniški centr in pro, prostor za likovnike, umetnike, ustvarjalce. Na drugi strani pa vemo, da uh, že 50 let mestna občina Ljubljana ni investirala v prostore za ustvarjalce in da je to velika potreba v mestu. To, tako za uh, delovne prostore, kot seveda za rezidence, za izmenjave umetnikov. No in to je bilo pravzaprav prvo izhodišče, ko smo se začeli uh, lutevati tega projekta, pravzaprav kakšne bojo tukaj vsebine. Uh, ena od seveda pomembnih zadev je na začetku, ko seveda pripravljamo ta projekt, je tudi kdo ga bo upravljal. Uh, mi imamo pač recimo v grobem tri variante, imamo javnosebno partnerstvo, imamo nevladni sektor, imamo javni sektor. Že, to se pravi, na začetku mora biti jasno, kak, na kakšen način ne, naj programi znotraj tega potekajo, da se potem odločimo, kateri od teh pravzaprav bo prevladal. Um, Vesela sem, da uh, ravno kar pripravljamo tudi eno javno zasebno partnerstvo, kar je redkost pri nas. Uh, to je kulturni spomenik, uh, let, staro letališče, uh, v kratkem pričakujemo podpis pogodbe, kjer bo zasebnik dejansko investiral v uh, kulturni spomenik in bo pač primerno vsebinam tudi seveda, pote, uh, primerno vsebine tudi seveda umestil v ta prostor. To je nekako na hitro zgodba. <laughs> Hvala lepa. Um, recimo, v, v mestni občini Ljubljana ste zelo veseli, da se je nek zasebnik uh, odločil ulagati v uh, uh, renovacijo kulturnega spomenika in v upravljanje tega kulturnega spomenika tudi. Uh, in vendar Ljubljana ima od vseh občin v Sloveniji ulaga največ denarja v kulturo. Uh, kaj bi pa predlagali drugim manjšim občinam, ki nimajo takšnih sredstev za kulturo, uh, kje, naj takšna, kje naj dobijo sredstva za revitalizacijo svojih uh, stavb? Ko sem prišla na mestno občino Ljubljana, je bil proračun za kulturo med 16 in 18 milijonov. Uh, danes je med 23 in 26 milijonov. Um, ne seveda vse v korist kulturne dediščine, ampak v veliki meri. Uh, Približno mesto vlaga med 2 in 3 milijona letno v obnovo kulturnih spomnikov in vzdrževanje kulturne dediščine. To pomeni, da smo pravzaprav to dosegli na način, da smo dokazali, pokazali, da je to pomembno. To se pravi skozi strategijo, skozi načrtovan razvoj, skozi uh, pripravljene projekte, uh, ki smo jih načrtovali kar nekaj let, ne vem, Švicerijo smo pripravljali, delamo že deseto leto, Plečnikovo hišo smo delali ravno tako deset let. Zelo na hitro je šel kino dvor, no, tam smo res čez noč stvari naredili, vendar ni šlo za tako velike posege. Uh, skratka, zelo načrtovano vodimo v bistvu vse te premike in skozi to seveda pridobivamo tudi možnost dodatnih sredstev. Usporedno pa zmeraj seveda poskušamo tudi pridobivati evropska sredstva. Ne, neko, en, včasih smo uspešni, včasih ne. Pri Švicariji, na primer, nismo bili uspešni. Vendar, kljub temu se mi zdi pomembno uh, zaprošati za ta sredstva že zato, ker te na nek način prisilijo obrazci, sistemi in vse to, da pravzaprav greš skozi vse sistem, kaj vse je potrebno za projekt, da so ti jasni cilji že od vsega začetka, Seveda se bojo stvari skozi čas spreminjali znotraj tega, vendar tisti ključni osnovni cilji morajo biti jasni od začetka do konca projekta. In naprimer tudi ta evropska sredstva včasih, če jih ne dobimo, seveda recimo, da je saj vloga koristna za to, da seveda nas prisili v nek sistem, da malo bolj sistematično načrtujemo. Skratka, čim več analiz in strategije, čeprav so včasih dohomorne. Se pravi, treba se začeti ukvarjati s projekti, potem pa s problemi pridejo tudi rešitve. Ne? <laughs> Še eno obražanje in sicer uh, v javnosti se pogosto pojavlja mnenje, da ja, ja, se že imamo to krasno hišo, uh, ki je kulturno zaščitena, ampak da kratko jo pa dejansko hočemo revitalizirati na sodoben način in vanjo vnesti neke sodobne vsebine, se pa zaplete pri uh, Zavodu za varstvo kulturne dediščine, ki ničesar ne posteve in da je tukaj nekaj kolegov iz Zavrda za varstvo kulturne dediščine, ampak 
Recimo, kaj, kaj v takem primeru? Je to res takšna, takšna situacija, resnična ali je malo mitološka, bi rekla? No, če dam primer, uh, uh, kolegi večer manj poznate Švicerijo, zdajle, če bi rekli, da bomo tam umestili pač šolo in bi zahtevali, ne vem, kakšne steklene površine, seveda je logično, da spomeniška služba to ne bo pustila. To je jasno, ne? Mislim, da to, ko sem prej rekla, vsaka osebina ne gre v vsak objekt. To se pravi, že pri načrtovanju osebin je treba razmišljati o tistih uh, osnovnih potezah kulturnega spomenika, na kak način in pravzaprav, kaj je tisto dopustno in kaj ni dopustno. To se pravi, tudi nekaj vedenje že pri načrtovalcu o tem, kakšne so neke možnosti nekega objekta in kje jih apsolutno ni. Seveda pa se potem znotraj tega, če so seveda osebine smiselne, vedno najdejo kompromisi, rešitve, ideje in tudi spomniška služba pri nas, kako se včasih sliši, da je hudba obav, ni tako strašna, mogoče stoji malo na okopi zaradi pač svoje pozicije, ker se vse čas bori na terenu, kar je razumljivo, vendar za nekim pametnim dialogom se zmeraj najdejo rešitve, tako da to mislim, da ne sme biti uvira. No, torej uvirni. <laughs> Alma Selimovič je predstavnica uh, upravljavcev. Uh, je predstavnica upravljavcev in sicer je del nevladne organizacije, ki upravlja z staro mestno elektrarno v Ljubljani. Alma, uh, pogosto si nevladne organizacije ali pa tudi posamezniki in podjetja zamišljamo, kako super bi bilo dobiti neko lepo staro stavbo v središču mesta in potem v tej stavbi prirejati koncerte in kulturne prireditve in potem ljudje pridejo in je to uh, srečen konec, lepe zgodbe. Uh, ampak kaj dejansko... Kaj dejansko dobimo s tem, ko dobimo eno tako stavbo upravljanje? Ali je res vse tako rožna to? Kaj, kaj se potem zgodi v tistem trenutku, ko dobiš to stavbo upravljanje? Uh, veš, kaj pravijo za uresničitev san? Da je to najhujša noč na mora. Ne? Uh, uh, ne, zdaj sem malo premočno začela. Tako je, um, dokler nimaš stavbe oziroma dokler nimaš infrastrukture za neko dejavnost, ki jo opravljaš, je to seveda nekaj sanskega. Ne? Um, ko pa to dobiš, pa moraš spremeniti način delovanja. Ne? Čeprej deluješ zelo taktično, torej imaš neke programe, ki jih uh, hipno umeščaš, hipno se lahko odločaš, te v bistvu infrastruktura oziroma prostor totalno pri zemlji in moraš začeti delati absolutno bolj strateško kot prej. In zdaj spremenba tega mindseta je, um, se mi zdi, precej težka in naporna, uh, predvsem pa um, nihče ne dobi stavbe v idealnih okoliščinah. Ne? Jaz mislim, da se mi tudi zato izvala k temu vprašanju in sicer Uh, jaz sem bila enkrat na enem ful lepem sestanku, kjer smo se pogovarjali o strategiji in je potem ena kolegica rekla, ja, v redu, v redu bomo razmišljali o strategiji, ampak jaz imam pokvarjene vece v stavbi, ne? Uh, o tem moram razmišljati. Skratka, razpet si med neko zelo strateško razmišljanje in neke upravljavske probleme, ki se tičejo velikih vsakodnevnih banalnosti, torej v neko gospodinstvo si porinjen, ne? Um, ki je sicer zelo lepo in uh, mi imamo precej dobro izku, izkušnjo staromestno elektrarno, uh, mogoče tudi uh, deloma zaradi tega, ker prej je bil nek razmislek o tem, kaj naj bi noter bilo in stavba je primerna uh, za opravljanje te dejavnosti. Um, je pa tako, kot si, ti si tudi omenila besedo dekor, ne, tehniška dediščina, v kateri smo mi in tudi kulturna, je izjemno lep dekor. Ko stopiš noter, to je fascinantno, stopiš v proizvodno halo 120 let staro, ampak seveda smo znotri nekih okvirjev, ki so pa nesprejemljivi, ker pa to je dediščina, ki pa tudi predstavlja neke realne okoliščine našega delovanja oziroma pri nas dodatno še to, da to, je, um, da to nisem dediščina, ampak je živa stvar. Noter je logistični centr za elektriko, torej mi podlegamo tudi nekim drugim realnostim, kot je ta. Ne. Mogoče še, še vprašanje. Vi ste dejansko to revitalizacijo stare melesne elektrarne zelo resno že pred leti zastavili. V cel razvoj ste upeli tudi slavnega urbanega socioloka gospoda Bianchinija, Uh, vendar pa se s časom potrebe in pogoji dela spreminjajo. Na kakšen način vi v bistvu, uh, uh, na kakšen način razvijate svoje občinstvo, na kakšen način ga ohranjate? Um, 
Mi delamo, tako kot sem prej rekla, da nekako plujemo med taktiko in strategijo, tako tudi plujemo med ogromno deležniki. Ne? Uh, en bistven uh, deležnik za nas so seveda financeri. Mi upravljamo s prostorom uh, in dobivamo za to sredstva ministrstva in mesta. Torej, oni so en naš deležnik. Drugi za nas izjemno pomemben deležnik, uh, predim pridem do občinstva, je seveda tako imenovana scena. Mi upravljamo prostor, ki je na voljo drugim. Torej, mi nimamo notri samo svojega programa. Naš program predstavlja mogoče 20% od celotnega programa v prostoru, ker je bil prostor revitaliziran uh, in je financiran zato, uh, da nudi nek servis in ta servis je, da zagotavlja prostor, da zagotavlja oder in vadbene površine za uh, nevladno oprizoritveno sceno. Uh, in torej že to sta dva zelo močna akterja z ogromno interesi, potem pa je seveda naš ključni deležnik, ki pa je občinstvo um, in zdaj kako pa mi zagotavljati prostor, ki bo za občinstvo na nek način privlačen, po drugi strani pa ki bo nudil vsebine, ki jih drugi ni na voljo. Pričemer imamo izjemno malo vplivo na, se, na vsebine, ker nimamo programskega denarja, ampak imamo upravljavski denar, torej mi gostimo večinoma tuje programe. Ne. Um, zdaj, mi se z občinstvom oziroma na splošno z neko našo vlogo v tej lokalni skupnosti, ki je na mikroravni četrt tabor, na mal večji ravni Ljubljana, ampak vse do mednarodne javnosti, um, poskušamo lotevati z prepletanjem, uh, tako da v elektrarni najdete neke mikrolokalne programe do ogromnih mednarodnih programov, ki jih večinoma prenesejo noter mednarodni festivali, tudi naš med drugim. Um, in z nekim niveliranjem med tem. Ne? In se mi zdi, da je čar elektrarne ravn v tem, da lahko notrš najdeš neko mikroaktivnost, kjer gostimo sosednjo šolo, lahko pa najdeš neko totalno uveljavljeno ime sodobne v prizoritvene scene, ki pride po vseh evropskih odrih še k nam, oziroma ne, najprej k nam, potem pa na vse druge velike evropske odre. Ne? No, skromne že niste. <laughs> Ampak zdaj še eno vprašanje, tudi prav, da niste skromni, zar je, ker namreč stara elektrarna je res pomembno mesto v Ljubljani in tudi v soseski tabor, kjer se nahaja, je v zadnjih letih tako rekod spremenila način življenja soseske, povezovanja raznih deležnikov. Ali ima kaj mislite, na kakšen način bi ta soseska živela, če stare elektrarne ne bi bilo? V tem smislu, kot je sedaj namenjene za skupnostnim vsebinam, kulturi? Zdaj si spet ne upam stopiti na ta teren pretencioznosti, ne? Kar, kar. <laughs> Ampak, um, ko se je elektrarna otvorila leta 2004, je uh, elektrarna otvorila scena in dogodek se je imenoval, če nas ne bi bilo, bi si nas morali izmisliti. Uh, jaz mislim, da če ne bi bilo elektrarne, bi se si sigurno, sigurno kdo zmislil kaj druga. Uh, mislim, da je uh, to, kar se dogaja na taboru in v uh, okrog elektrarne, tudi del nekega širšega gibanja po Ljubljani, Ljubljana vse spreminja. Jaz sem zelo dober lakmus v papir, ker nisem iz Ljubljane in Ljubljana je zelo drugačna, kot je bila 10-15 let nazaj. Mislim pa, da je elektrarna oziroma delovanje okrog nje mogoče dalo en tak odločilen puš znotraj četrti, ker smo z ostalimi organizacijami, ki jih je v tej četrti ogromno tudi so, so ustanovil uh, kulturno četrt tabor in da je dala en tak um, ključen poriv mogoče in s programi v elektrarni deloma, pa tudi z, elektrar, z programi, ki se nekak pronicajo ven iz elektrarne. Um, tle je bil spet uh, odločilen en, um, v bistvu ena raziskava potreb, ki smo jo naredili znotraj četrti, um, kjer smo poskušali uh, lokalno prebivalstvo predvsem sondirati z vprašanji, kaj, kaj, če se jim manjka. Um, ugotovil se je, da jim manjka pa skupnostnih aktivnosti, da pogrešajo zelene površine um, in pa prostore druženja, ki niso komercialni. Uh, in na to smo se mi odzvali z nekimi mikroakcijami, ki smo jih izvajali z, predvsem v partnerstvu z drugimi organizacijami in mislim, da je bil dober odziv. Uh, je pa to tako zelo dolgotrajno delo, uh, ki rodi sadove po letih in letih dela. M- pro- poskušamo se pa prilagoditi tudi razmeram, ker recimo uh, odkar je elektrarna uh, oder, se je tudi situacija odrov v Ljubljani bistveno spremenila. Ne? Ko je elektrarna odprla svoje vrata, je bila eden izmed redkih podobnih odrov. Od takrat so še španski borci, kino, šiška, še nekaj drugih inicijativ. Tako da mi tudi moramo neprestano iskati neko svoje mesto pod soncem oziroma skozi ugotavljati 
kaj rabi občinstvo, uh, kaj rabi umetniška skupnost in nekako probati najti pot med temi potrebami. No. Hvala lepa. Um, zdaj pa moj naslednji sogovornik. <laughs> Masimo ti se boš verjetno lahko navezal na, te, uh, zadnje, na to zadnje razmišljanje uh, nedela? No. Aha. <laughs> uh, do you have your... Um, yes. okay. Okay. Now, ok, now I can hear. Verjetno se boš lahko navezal na ta zadnja razmišljanja uh, Alme Selimovič hmm. o temu, kako so pomembni deležniki za razvoj nekega projekta, kako je stalno treba delati z ljudmi, da projekt živi. Uh, ker namreč uh, vaša uh, revitalizirana kmetija um, dejansko je povezala med sebojno kar deset nevladnih in zasebnih organizacij in tudi danes ima številne deležnike. Um, povejte mi, kako s takšno kmetijo dejansko upravljate, ker smo videli, da je vaš uh, upravljavski uh, model kar zakompliciran. Ne samo, da imate um, svet direktorjev, Uh, v ta upravljavski model so vključeni številni deležniki, pa še prostovoljci zraven. Kako to poteka na vsak danje ravni? Because uh, we came from the from a volunteer and activist uh, story of uh, pr pressure to the municipality, and we had to transform that in a managing uh, model, and uh, so we decided uh, to create uh, to to help the volunteer to create a, a, a stable table uh, that uh, each uh, week or each two weeks. Uh, they uh, they will meet and decide which are the issues from their point of view and uh, one uh, member of the board participate uh, to the volunteer meetings uh, trying to explain uh, what the reason why the decision of the board uh, and trying to capture the main issues from the volunteer table and uh, in the very beginning, uh, we also create a table with the commercial activities managers because uh, in the first part of our activity to, to fit uh, a restaurant uh, with, uh, for free cultural activities uh, and social activities, it was not uh, so easy. So we have had uh, one table for, um, I don't remember exactly, three or four months, uh, with all the commercial activities to establish uh, the common guidelines uh, for the managing of the spaces, uh, for, for managing also for daily to daily uh, measures, uh, stuff, and, and so on. Afterward, we, we closed, we end because it was too difficult to have so many meetings, and uh, we established uh, to see um, every time a big problem uh, uh, was uh, at the doors. And uh, we have uh, the assembly uh, once, no, twice uh, a year. And uh, the assembly is the place uh, where all the mm, 10 entities uh, try to know and to participate uh, to decide the strategy. The board is uh, for a daily day to day decision. The table of the volunteers uh, mm, try to contribute. Uh, to the board decisions uh, and the stakeholder, the other stakeholder, the commercial activities uh, when a problem is at the door. This is the our model. Skratka, uh, zadeva je kar, kar kompleksna, ne? ni samo enega pač <laughs> <laughs> oskega, oske skupine ljudi, ki bi vsemo odločala, ampak um, zanima me, um, na kakšen način pa videli smo, da imate kar nekaj zasebnih partnerjev, komercijalnih tudi. Na kakšen način uh, pa vključujete uh, te komercijalne partnerje in na kakšen način jih sploh izbirate? Ali jih izbirate, ker videli smo, da za razliko od vseh večine ostalih primerov uh, niste subvencionirani mm -hmm. strani um, občina ali države, ampak dejansko vi plačujete občini za to, da lahko izvajate skupnostne programe. <laughs> to je res <laughs> predvsej zanimiv primer. Um, ampak vseeno ste se odločili, da uh, večina vaših dejavnosti ne bo komercijalnih, kar je kar nepričakovano. Uh, yeah, the, 
the mm, the model for uh, the political and economic uh, uh, managing of the commercial activities uh, was uh, established uh, starting from uh, some guidance uh, for the selection of the commercial activities and uh, at the end uh, for the main one that is the restaurant uh, was one of the associates that decided to to start to managing these activities creating uh, a company for uh, this managing and uh, fitting uh, 100% to our guidance, of course. Uh, for the other ones, uh, of course, we, to all the commercial activities, of course, uh, we ask for a rent, and this is the basis of our revenues, of the most part of our revenues. And uh, this other the other two parts of our revenues uh, come from the farmer market. That means uh, that uh, each farmer pay uh, one uh, one fee for their presence, and uh, the third part of our activity of our revenues come uh, when uh, we rent uh, a part of the not commercial activities for an association or for they pay also a little fee, but that depends from their nature. If they are private for profit, they pay more. If they are associated, they pay for example. Uh, theater rears, so they pay less and so on. We have these uh, three uh, possibility of to get revenues and some special project, but it's it would be <laughs> very long to explain. I think it's not. pravi da je razmerje med uh, um, komercijalnimi programi in nekimi javnimi, neprofitnimi programi zelo pomembno, če hočemo, uh, če hočemo razviti finančno, pa tudi vsebinsko mm -hmm. vzdržen projekt konc konc na koncu koncev, ne? Uh, še eno, mm, ena zadeva se mi je nekako usidrala v spomin v vaši predstavitvi in sicer, da ste v vaši predstavitvi izpostavili več namenskost prostora kot uh, eden od pomembnih faktorjev vaše uspešnosti. Ja, bi lahko o tem kaj več povedali? Yes, it was, um, it was the also another big challenging big challenge at our start, at our beginning, because we knew for sure that uh, we had 70% uh, of space uh, without commercial activities, and the idea was, uh, was uh, what to do with that. And so the volunteers uh, present some projects about uh, what to do, and uh, we decided that all these projects uh, were good, or almost all, but we had, we had the necessity to have a space uh, uh, free from uh, furniture, free from uh, everything that uh, uh, hampered the possibility to change the use each day. So we have a very flexible model also with the staff uh, for to move uh, and to transform uh, all the whole, all the rooms, uh, depending from what is uh, happening uh, this day. Of course, uh, the the collective garden no th there are some steady <laughs> things that but uh, the most part uh, of the space is continuously transformed each day depending on what is happening and i think that it's uh, a good the best solution also because we have a lot of relation with the different uh, different companies different association different cultural entities uh, and we have the possibility also to select the best one from our point of view for for our strategy and uh, also for their own uh, possibility to have some good activities in our space. Hvala lipa. Um, zdaj bi pa še mogoče vašo pozornost obrnila malce na našo lokalno sceno in sicer, uh, ko ste verjetno videli, uh, ima Ljubljana kar močno ruralno zaledje. Zakaj mislite, da je pomembno, da je pomembno nekako ohranjati to ruralno dediščino tudi v mestih? <coughs> Oh yes, I think um, but you are you are as I have seen you are doing many things about that. But uh, we have uh, tried to use also our farm hold our structure to to show all to the people for example to the school what is uh, the agri what what is what was and what is uh, agriculture uh, what is also because Milan has a big part of agriculture in this territory. And uh, for example, a uh, few people know that uh, a large part of the rice that is uh, eaten in the cities or in, 
in the region came uh, from the southern part of Milan. And so we have established the necessity to reinforce uh, the identity, the agricultural identity of our region, also hosting some uh, shows, some picture exhibitions, some uh, conferences, some, uh, uh, yes, some, some book presentation about uh, the agricultural reality around uh, Milan and uh, to create a bridge between an ancient farm hold that now is not a farm hold and, and uh, all the farm hold activities that uh, are going on now surrounding the Milan and the Cascina. Hvala lepa. Mogoče, če podate svoj, vaši sosedi mikrofon, ki bo moja zadnja sogovornica. Hvala. Uh, Marija, uh, poslušali smo pač vse te zanimive predstavitve uh, iz vašega projekta in uh, mislim, da nas je ena bolj navduševala kot druga. Um, pa kaj imajo po vašem skupnega vsi ti dobri primeri? Kaj, kaj so ti elementi, ki, se, ki so se v vaši analizi stalno ponavljali? Yes, uh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I have uh, asked myself these questions the last month nearly every day. I had this big package of very, very interesting practices. And there was obviously a common denominator. But it was hard uh, to give the baby a name. You can name it in a very abstract level, in a scientific words, or in very basic words, and common words. But... Um, we have heard uh, very, um, very uh, practical ideas of common dominator and uh, examples, and um, I uh, have chosen to um, to take uh, and to speak in the abstract level. So I would like uh, to answer this question with open-mindedness. I saw in every practice open-mindedness, um, and due to. Um, the cooperation between the partners, the public partner, private partner, and the uh, uh, cultural and creative contributors. And I have seen open-mindedness in the basic concept of the practices. And um, to say this in exaggerated words, I would uh, uh, like to describe a scene. <laughs> um, <coughs> open-mindedness um, from the um, audience's or guests' point of view. If you <coughs> have um, a normal commercial place, an urban environment, uh, like a cinema, you go straight to through the door with your partner, you go to the point of sales, uh, pay your ticket, take your Coca-Cola, take your popcorn, go inside, um, watch uh, the watch um, the newest blockbuster, and after that uh, you go home uh, uh, straight to your apartment, and that's it. If you go to a local um, independent cinema, um, um, for example, a watershed in uh, Great Britain and Bristol, or um, other. Um, spaces like uh, we have um, seen here and presented here. Um, you go slowly through the door. <laughs> you enter a space to be. You look uh, right and left and see a curly space on the wall. There are pictures of uh, local artists and painters. And then um, you check the flyers because of the very interesting cultural program. Um, which uh, is presented in this room, and because it's not only a cinema, there are um, a lot of other possibilities. Then to go to your to the um, ticket sales point, and then um, you begin uh, you begin um, to um, have a little talk uh, to the salesman because he's um, not only. Um, here to gain salary, uh, but uh, he is living uh, next to the space or has his um, um, his atelier next to this because he's the painter. He um, the whole day he um, uh, met his work, and after that he's um, earning some money at the ticket sales. After that, you go and watch a very interesting um, art house movie, and after. Um, uh, gaining such uh, impressive um, experience, uh, you have a um, discussion with the regisseur 
uh, of this film because he was invited and you uh, have the possibility uh, to uh, get into contact and uh, to um, get information about his motivations to make this film and uh, after that you end up in the bar next to the next to the space and, and after uh, we yeah uh, prefer not just to a know very long story. <laughs> maybe maybe um, you um, have an idea which uh, what would I like to say with open mindedness super um, se pravi uh, vsi si lahko predstavljamo to uh, nekako svobodno odprto mišljenje v teh prostorih kulture in kreativnosti, ampak zato, da ti prostori delujejo, zato, da so finančno vzdržni, zato, da, da ima na takar lahko poklic in prodaja tisto pivo, um, pač uh, mora nekdo v ozadju uh, vse lepo skonstruirati in splanirati. Um, Recimo, v vseh teh primerih, ki ste jih analiz analizirali, kaj so tisti aspekti, ki bi bili prenošljivi iz ene države v drugo? Ker dosti krat smo se znašli vsi v kakšnih takšnih prostorih, ponavadi v tujini in smo si rekli, o, super, to je super prostor, ampak uh, pri nas kaj takšnega ni možno. Um, kaj pa je tisto, kar je možno prinesti iz ene v drugo prakso, konkretno v teh vaših primerih? Yeah, in this case, uh, it's um, a good idea to look on um, elements which are already transferred. Um, there are um, uh, elements um, which um, are obvious. They um, uh, come again and again, and um, some practices um, choose uh, the same uh, possibility for financing, um, financing um, like others. And uh, for example, I have seen a lot um, um <coughs> an um, element uh, which um, I would uh, like to um, name um, to gain property. Um, we have seen um, in case of uh, Stana Electrana that is also a, a very interesting possibility or opportunity to um, run the program as the NGO and to be one of the contributors um, in the public-private uh, um, partnership. But it's also uh, possible to choose uh, the another one. I've seen a lot uh, of practices like that. Um, they choose to buy the place. <laughs> and it's... Uh, pff, I, um, uh, I have no idea how it's possible to be so, so brave, uh, but um, for example, <coughs> um, um, it's um, interesting um, if you would like to gain property and choose this uh, way and uh, you only have the public partner as the contributor, uh, so different roles. Um, then uh, often the NGOs or um, yeah found a um, limited liable company, and uh, for example in Germany we have the situation there's a so-called Mietshäuser Syndikat syndicate seems uh, like crime and it's uh, maybe a little little bit political name but it's a very um, impressive um, example because. It um, already swept around borders. It's um, a model where um, at the beginning in 1999, um, people uh, who would like to have their own houses in urban space um, could um, found this uh, limited liable company together with the syndicate. And there were, um, yeah, it was possible to, to um, gain um, private loans with this company and um, now uh, after years we have 123 very successful projects and now there's the point uh, and because of that is that's um, for example an interesting element which is transferable um, it um, came out that uh, now we have uh, not only a project to gain space for living but also with, with this model um, space to gain cultural and open spaces for everyone 
Hvala lepa. Čas, naš čas se približuje k koncu, tako da bi jaz samo še zaključila ta pogovor z nekaj kratkimi mislimi naših odeležen, ki in odeleženca. In sicer zanima me, če lahko v enem ali dvem stavkih za zaključek poveste, kaj je tisto najbolj pomembno pri revitalizaciji stavb kulturne dediščine, oziroma pri njihovem upravljanju. Pa začnemo kar z vami, Tiva, ki ste tudi otvorili tale pogovor. I think the most important thing in the revitalization of cultural heritage and the sort of ability to perpetuate them is resilience. You need to plan for success and failure. You need to plan for growth and shrinking. Um, you need to plan for different sizes of consortia. You need to plan for different sizes of groups, different sizes of volunteers. Um, the more resilient you can make your organization, the more likely it is to survive whatever gets thrown your way. Um, and that will ensure that the heritage that you are seeking to rescue um, is more likely to be protected. Jaz bi rekla, da je treba dobro razmisliti, kaj bo noter, da že ko se dela prenova, da se razmišlja o tem, kdo bo prostor uporabljal, kako ga bo uporabljal in seveda razmišlja tudi o mejitvah, ki jih dediščina daje, ampak predvsem prilagoditi prostor in ga narediti uporabnega in prijetnega tistim, ki potem prihajajo noter z neko novo rabo. Hvala leta. I I agree with Tiva. The resilience that is uh, in our case, and I think that it's a transferable model, means uh, multi-level governance, uh, a multi-purpose use, uh, and a multi multi-revenue model. This is, uh, I think, um, the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two more sentences. <laughs> And from, from the point uh, of view um, of the person who had to collect and to transfer everything, I would uh, um, like to say, um, please don't what you are doing now, uh, do what you are doing now. Um, get into contact, communicate to each other and um, um, gain, gain trust and gain um, communication the whole time, on a also on an international way. Yeah, it's a good element. Bi jaz nadaljevala s komunikacijo. Mislim, da komunikacija je res izjemnega pomena pri vsakem načrtovanju projekta in potem tudi izvedbi revitalizacije in seveda potem tudi delovanju in v sebinah. Podarila bi to zato, ker od vsega začetka, ko so jasni cilji, mora biti seveda vsaj delno jasni tudi vsi deležniki, ki bodo seveda sodelovali v tem procesu revitalizacije in kasnejšega izvajanja nekega programa. Zato je ta komunikacija konstantna in seveda vsi, ki kdajkoli ste ali boste obnavljali nek spomenik in želeli, da kasneje v njem poteka nek program, ki bo seveda vzdržan, kvaliteten in bo nadgradil to dediščino, seveda vedno je potrebno od vsega začetka imeti dobro komunikacijo z vsemi. Od tistih, ki jih izseliš iz hiše in seveda jih moraš premestiti na nek drug prostor, do tistih, ki bodo kasneje opravljali, do tistih, ki bodo kasneje do tistih, ki delajo in obnavljajo sam spomenik. Skratka, vsi, ki participirajo kakorkoli pri najmanjšem delu tega procesa. Najlepša hvala. Zdaj pa mogoče še čas za nekaj vprašanj. Vidim, da že vsi željno čakate. Prosim, ko postavite vprašanje, se predstavite in tudi povejte, komu je vprašanje namenjeno. Hvala. Čart Tauzas from the Institute for the Protection of Culture and Heritage of Slovenia. I'd like to pose two questions, actually. One for Ms. Montovano directly and one more general question. Thank you for a great presentation you made and the contribution to this roundtable. Do you have, and could you share it with us, do you have like a 
manual for managing um, uh, various types of stakeholders that you uh, that you engage in in um, renovation and re revitalization processes. Because uh, on one hand, right, we heard today that let's say my institution is supposed to be this huge break on everything, and 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 and, and um, uh, so how do you avoid situations like that? And apropos your statement that two heads know more than one, but you have a very nice proverb in English too, uh, too many cooks spoil the broth, <laughs> right? So there must be, there must be a, there must be a way to deconflict situations. Mm -hmm. And so do you have any formal uh, list uh, on that? Our organization doesn't have any formal guidance on how to manage stakeholders uh, in terms of things like stakeholder mapping or implementing a communication plan. But there is a lot of guidance out there in the UK for voluntary sector organizations that want to do this. Um, personally, I would also look at actual formalized project management methodologies. Um, I find that they are also quite helpful to kind of help you get things right in your head. Um, stakeholder mapping is a really useful exercise that we tend to do because you identify all your different stakeholders and then you put them on a kind of matrix based on the power that they have over your project and the interest that they have over your project. And then you can work out who the ones are that are really important that you need to stay in communication with or that you need to continue to kind of convert. And then you have the ones that you can worry about maybe a little bit later. Um, we do have some guidance on our website on business planning, which is useful. Obviously, it's got a UK focus, but it was recently translated into Dutch. Um, so if you read Dutch, you could also have a copy of it, I suppose. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, technically, thank you. Uh, a, a question for all of you. Um, I've really missed um, information and communication technologies role in the whole event today, except for fleeting uh, a reference to using social media. Uh, I'm, I'm missing the whole sector here that can actually, in my opinion at least, uh, very profoundly impact on our work and our uh, success on of our efforts in revitalization of heritage. Thank you. That's quite a contentious comment. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a fair point to say that we kind of have glossed over the power that social media and communication can have in some of these projects. I mean, to give you an example from the UK, um, there is on the south bank of the River Thames um, an area called the Royal Festival Hall, another spectacular brutalist monster, with um, an undercroft in the basement which has become the home of skateboarding in the UK. It, it just kind of, it was, a, it was an organic thing that happened in the 1970s and 80s with that when people took up skateboarding, they started to skateboard in the undercroft. And it became like the home of, of British skateboarding. Now, the Royal Festival Hall, which is the building above, is a national institution and it wanted to revitalize its building to try and generate more income. And um, they decided they wanted to displace the skateboarders. Um, the skateboarders were not happy about this, and through a social media campaign, they actually managed to obtain 60,000 objections to the planning application from all over the world, which effectively stopped the Royal Festival Hall in its tracks, and they now have to completely change their plans to incorporate the skateboarders back into the design of, of the new program. So you're absolutely right that, you know, don't underestimate the power of social media and communication. But I think also, you know, 50,000 likes isn't 50,000 euros. So it's a balance. Mogoče še kdo od gostov želi odgovoriti na to vprašanje? V redu naslednje vprašanje, prosim. Hello, my name is Janusz Kerešnje. I'm working with uh, the Cultural Innovation Competency Center in Pech, in Hungary. Actually, we run a co-working house in a heritage building, which is privately owned. But uh, in our uh, best practice, we showed our uh, cultural district, which is uh, publicly owned. And I think one of the main uh, question, and uh, I would emphasize a little bit more, uh, this question is the ownership. There is a, a very big dis, uh, difference between countries which had never been under communism and post-communist countries as well. 
because the, during the communism, the private ownership didn't exist. So neither the capital. There is no capital. There are no private people who has enough capital to renovate a building like that. So the situation is completely different. And all the local governments are in big trap if they have to, uh, in uh, Eastern countries, so the post-communist countries, all the local gov government has a big problem because uh, there is not enough capital in the private sector to help uh, the renovation or uh, revitalization of abandoned buildings. And uh, I just see, Louis, I just remember that Germany is the exception because you become in one country, so that's <laughs> it's a bit different, but uh, the other countries are in, uh, in a deep problem. And uh, the private, uh, the public-private partnership could be the solution for that. And this is our goal, to establish this kind of models. And I think the reprivatization, some kind of conditional reprivatization, could be a basis of a new model. It, uh, it has an effect for the, for the running and the sustainability as well. Uh, I just uh, I just uh, try to analyze the best practices and I recognize that almost everywhere there is public money. Even if we talk about the power plant, the power plant was owned by a private company, but it was not Eon. It was, uh, I suppose, a Slovenian company before, and it became uh, later the property became public and it became privatized for the EN, and, uh, and the business model is uh, it's quite interesting nowadays. Who pays for whom? Who pays to whom for what? And this is the question always. We have to, we have to put these three questions. So that's why I love the Italian model, because it's completely private in this, in this working system, in this, in this uh, business model, because you have never have to apply for public uh, tr uh, support. You have to keep your property in a good shape, even if you have to pay some uh, money for the, it's not a small money, you have to pay for the, the government. So I think my question, I'm sorry for the long, <laughs> uh, and the long uh, ideas, but uh, my question is, don't you think that uh, to change the state of uh, ownership would be the first step. Kdo bi odgovoril na to vprašanje, na ta izjiv? Interesting that you should say reprivatization because that's pretty much exactly what's happening in the UK. Um, local authorities are divesting themselves of public buildings in masses because they cannot afford to keep them or maintain them anymore. It's even happening in, in central London with those really important government buildings that are being sold off um, and being turned into hotels or you know things like that. Um, I think there is definitely a place in the market. There has to be for private interests to invest in heritage, um, without question, because we have so much. Um, and, you know, public funds are decreasing. So I think that's why this conference is quite timely, because working up those models is essential. Yeah, and just one, one remark, I just forgot to mention. It is a, a hypocrite uh, approach to say uh, the business is something from devil in these places. I'm completely agree with those models where the business is the uh, running machine of uh, of the maintenance and uh, and the running of the business, uh, running of the heritage places. I think I think that's probably fair. I don't think any of us think that business is the devil. No, no, no. There, but there is an offering sometimes. There, yeah, I'm sure that there. Be a business yeah. No, I quite agree. <laughs> Does anybody else want to say? I'd be interested to know um, that way. Morda bi odgovorila uh, na ta način, da m, v Ljubljani se že dolgo časa trudimo, da bi našli seveda zasebne investitorje uh, v kulturne spomenike in to je problem, velik problem.
to priznam. In zato sem bila tudi že prej tako vesela, ko sem povedala, da smo našli nekoga, ki bo investiral v staro, najstarejše, pač slovensko, ljubljansko letališče, ki je danes že skoraj del mesta v neposredni bližini trgovskega centra BTC. Ko smo razmišljali o vsebini, seveda jasno je, da si vsak želi, da je tam predstavljeno staro letališče, prvo letališče in tako naprej. Vendar, kako animirati investitorja, da seveda bo šel v javno zasebno partnerstvo, da bo podpisal pogodbo za 20, 30 let in seveda investiral svoje sredstva. Dolgo časa smo sklejevali, seveda, da se je tudi on našel v tem projektu in da je z tega videl, da seveda recimo, da bo imel vsaj pozitivno nulo, če ne dobička, kar pomeni, da to ni enostavno, je težko. Še posebej v svetu, kjer seveda privatni kapital ni navajen vlagati v vediščino v umetnost. Imamo nekaj izjeme, kot je Škrabčeva domačija, tudi v Sloveniji, imamo posamezniki. Tudi to se razvija. Tem stvarjem seveda je potrebno čas, veliko časa, ker če pomislim, kako je bilo pred 25 leti v Sloveniji, ko seveda ljudje si niso zavedali dediščine, ko so indiferentni do tega, ko je bilo seveda, če si rekel, dediščine, bilo nekaj, kar je bilo odveč. Danes je pa tudi skozi to animacijo ljudi, da so ljudje tisti, ki bodo ohranili dediščino. Seveda, edina pot za to, da se vzpostavi ta kultura in skozi to kulturo seveda bo prišlo tudi do tega, da se bodo našli investitori tudi na področju gospodarstva, zasebnega kapitala, ki bodo, jaz dverjamem v to, začeli vlagati. Seveda pa to ni čez noč, to je zelo, zelo dolga pot. Jaz vem, da dnevi dediščine smo jih začeli kdaj gojko pred 25 leti in je velik rezultat. Je velik rezultat ravno v tem prebiku razmisleka o tem, kaj dedična, kaj ti pomeni in ali je smiselno v njo vlagati ali ne. In tukaj mislim, da upam, da gremo naprej. Želi mogoče še kdo? Yes, just one thing that I want to add, because I hope our model is not replied in other situations, because we have a public ownership, and uh, a no-profit, uh, a private no-profit management uh, that hosts the commercial activities. Okay, it's good, but it's possible only because uh, our location, our structure has a high commercial value and uh, it's possible to rent uh, with a high rent. I don't think it's possible to do that in many other places, in, in Milan, uh, for example. And I know that in other cities in uh, Italy, for example, in Turin, they are trying to find a different model because 100% uh, restoration uh, from private uh, is, not, uh, is not possible from a commercial point of view, from a private point of view, because uh, you haven't uh, the possibility to get so, so much revenues if the location is not in a very good uh, position like the center of Milan. I'd like to tell you about uh, one of the initiatives that the Heritage Lottery Fund has in the UK, which is quite a groundbreaking model. It's called the Heritage Enterprise Scheme. And it's a grant scheme that they offer to partnership projects have to be spearheaded by a charity or a non-governmental organization, but there have to be business benefits and there has to be a private enterprise partner. And the purpose of the grant scheme is to bridge the conservation deficit that I was telling you about to enable private enterprise to thrive in that building. And I think it's surprising actually, but that scheme has not been taken up with nearly as much enthusiasm as we would have hoped in the UK. And I think the reason for that is because this whole idea of public-private partnership, um, first of all, it, it can be very tricky. And second of all, it, it can go so horribly wrong. Um, but I think 
um, I'd like to echo the comments of my colleague over there. The, the, the really powerful thing is the prestige that heritage has and people really value it. And I think it's our responsibility as heritage practitioners to almost be evangelists for why heritage is special, to convert people to the idea that working in a heritage building is a good idea, that being surrounded by heritage is a great idea. Because, you know, I've had so many people go, why keep it? Why don't you build something new? And you're like, but it's the story of the town. It's, it's amazing. Don't you want to know all of the amazing stories? And it, it's the job to, our job, I think, is to, to evangelize about why heritage is worth keeping. Nas ste že prepričali. <laughs> Vidimo pa, da je v ozadju še eno vprašanje, se mi zdi. Uh Ready. Um, my name is Miho, and I'm from uh, one. I'm, I'm uh, one of the directors of a municipal uh, cultural center in Bydgoszcz, Poland. I'm a director of literature and new media division. So, so as you can imagine, uh, my question will switch a bit the discussion into art and artistic values. Uh, and I have a question to. Uh, all my guests mostly, and uh, to Steve also, um, because uh, they mentioned uh, the, the process of negotiation of uh, needs uh, of users and of well artists. Uh, so I have a question: um, how, how, well, how to achieve this this state of equilibrium between uh, viewers, users' needs, and the needs of uh, artists that um, work in, the, in, in such a space we, we talk about? Uh, you never achieve it. I, y you always aspire <laughs> to achieve it. Uh, I guess it's uh, a lot of dialogue, as uh, everybody says. Um, <laughs> it's uh, constant negotiations, and you always fail, basically. <laughs> uh, but uh, every time you do it, you fail better, I think. Um, it's. Um, I think we are uh, witnessing, especially in, in Slovenia after 2009 and 2010, uh, worsening conditions in the NGO sector in terms of uh, financings being cut all the time. So the pressure on people that have resources, like a space, is getting tougher and tougher. And um, I think in, in these conditions, it's uh, our responsibility to really think about what we can offer, not just in terms of space, but also support. Uh, so one of, uh, I'll give you a practical example. Like one of our conscious decisions was uh, to, to support first productions, to support really small scale productions, to support things that wouldn't be able to get a space elsewhere. So, you know, not to contribute to, um, to people that already have a lot, giving them more, but like to, to support the most fragile part of the scene, to support the newcomers. It doesn't mean that we don't do big projects, but it means that, you know, our ear is especially sensitive to, to the ones that have no access to, to resources, basically. Um, in, in terms of audience, um, what's our, I think, um, biggest problem is that um, we are still working on the intuitive level. We don't have any serious research of our audience. We did research of needs, but it, again, it's a limited research where we can, you know, also respond in a limited way. So I think what would benefit wa us would be um, like a serious research of our audience. But I think on the intuitive level, we do try to sense what are the needs and especially try to follow what is it that is not offered in the city or on the scene and respond to that. Like uh, one of the things that we discovered is that there's a huge demand now for um, for dialogue, uh, for debate, uh, for a reflection, and uh, w we tried to respond to that, at least uh, uh, partly. And uh, we try to follow what's happening also e elsewhere, not, not, not just on our stage and in our space. But to be, to have an equilibrium, I think, um, I think we never have it. There, there is always things falling apart, and we, we try to pick them up. Um, what's that saying? You can't please all of the people all of the time. Um, 
it's interesting. We we recently did a, a feasibility study for a small theatre in the north of England um, that was until recently 100% funded by the local government. And the local government has come into an agreement with a local charity who are going to operate the theatre. Um, and over the next five years, their funding from the local government is going to taper off. So they came to us and said, help, how do we bridge the gap? How do we make the funding work? You know, how do we stand on our own two feet? And it's a very difficult question because if you have the luxury of being able to service an industry that really needs you, then that's a fantastic position to be in. But if you have to try and keep the roof on, then sometimes you have to do something that might be commercial, but not necessarily what you would like to do. Um, and I think you have to balance, you know, pragmatism with artistic vision um, in the interests of the building that you're looking after. Hvala lepa za um, to zanimivo vprašanje in zanimive odgovore. Slovenci smo znani po tem, da uh, imamo pozna kosila, ne bi vas radi zadrževali kot talce še dolgo časa, ampak vzajemo še zadnje kratko vprašanje, potem pa gremo res na kosilo. Prosim. Uh, Gojko Zupan, Minister of Culture, Director for Heritage. Vprašanje bo bolj slovenščji, najprej za Tivo, potem pa za Marijo. Uh, Tiva, da gremo širše, stavb na regije in na krajino. Kateri prostor Angliji bi bil zanimiv kot pozitiven vzorec ohranjene krajine in posameznih objektov v njem kot nek vzorec. Za Marijo pa še to, ker v njenem CV-u je, da je potovala v daljne dežele in najbolj razvita dežela tehnološko japonska Kaj bi se lahko mi naučili tudi od njihove uh, nesnovne, se pravi, intangible heritage? Um, hvala lepa za to vprašanje. Uh, obe gosti prosim, da ste zelo kratki pri odgovorih in se potem z kolegom zmenita za nadaljno razpravo še pri kosilu. So you want an example of, of positive regeneration on a large scale, not in a city. Um, that's a really tricky one, but I think one of the areas where it, we are seeing progress in the UK is obviously farming is getting um, bigger and bigger. So where we had small farms that were operated by perhaps one family, we now have one family operating you know, six times the size with machinery and modern technology. And what it means is that farmsteads in the countryside are being abandoned and are being left for no use anymore and there's a movement now to try and revitalize those farmsteads a for residential when there's always a demand but b um this is a fantastic idea as respite homes for people who are caring for sick family members or who have um, family members with special needs there are charities out there who will support them and who will give them a holiday and so they can go somewhere where their loved one is also looked after and they have a fantastic time together and the family member who's been spending their time caring for their loved one, they also get a break because there are specialists there who can contribute to the care and who can you know, help them enjoy themselves. And I think that's a fantastic example of a way to revitalize buildings that are not in an urban area, that don't have a dramatic impact on the landscape, but bring use back to rural areas. Hvala lepa. Še en kratek skok na Japonsko. <laughs> yeah, very big, uh, short jump. <laughs> um, I um, studied uh, the case of Japan um, um, ten years before and um, when I um, saw best practices like here, um, uh, it was obvious what is often said about Japan. Um, in relation to other industrial um, developed countries, um, Japan is always seven years before um, the, West, the other Western industrial um, developed countries. And yeah, what I, um, what I am um, seeing here today, I saw 10 years before in Japan. It's re really, uh, really true. And um, the most inter interesting element I have um, I have seen was uh, the Im importance of the neighbors, the locals. Um, they had uh, these little urban gardens. Um, 
And, uh, at forgotten places, uh, in front of their houses, uh, there's only stone and everything is not nice. But they create their own places and um, they uh, care about uh, their uh, cultural heritage and their buildings um, by their own. And it's also uh, quite opposite of the um, normal point of view about uh, Japan. Um, everyone thinks uh, community and uh, the community is the most important thing, but uh, my um, impression was uh, the opposite. Um, the um, importance of the locals, the neighbors uh, who are surrounded around uh, cultural heritage are um, the point of success. Hvala lepa, s tem bi zaključila današnjo okroglo mizo. Lepo se zahvaljujem vsem gostjam in gostu, ki je že umoral odleteti nazaj domov in bi predala besedo Tamari, da formalno zaključi današnjo konferenco in vam da še nadaljne tehnične napotke. Hvala.